things that God has provided uniquely for the members of the church. And we're ready to move on to the third point under number seven, the indwelling of the Trinity. We've seen the indwelling of God the Father in the believer's body. It's in the indwelling of God the Son in the believer's body. We now note the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit in the believer's body, which is given for us in Romans 8, 11, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, and 6, 19, and 20, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, and 6, 16. Now, the purpose of the indwelling, i leave that on for a minute, people are copying it, uh, the, fir uh, the first purpose uh, for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is to provide a temple for the indwelling of God the Son, Jesus Christ. There are no sanctuaries or temples left on the earth today. Though people may call their buildings sanctuaries, they may call them temples, they may call them all kinds of things, uh, they are not. The only temple which remains is the temple called the body of the, of, uh, of the believer made a temple by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This secondly, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit provides a base of operations for his uh, uh, provision of omnipotence, the means by which the believer executes the plan of God. In other words, this is the energy source that is available to every believer for the purpose of executing God's plan, of living the Christian way of life. The source of energy is specifically designed to be exactly what is needed to function in the plan of God. Just as every energy source has its own designation. Uh, the uh, gasoline is designed to uh, be the energy source for the gasoline engine. Uh, sugar, uh, uh, carbohydrates is the uh, energy source for the physical body. And so it is that omnipotence is the energy source for the spiritual believer to produce the plan of God, to live in accordance with what the plan of God calls for in every believer. Now, we execute the plan of God in two ways. Uh, one, by being filled or controlled by the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is the same as living or residing or functioning inside the divine dinosphere or living in our own pal palace, which God the Father has provided for us. Uh, the filling of the Spirit is something that takes place automatically when you confess all known sins. It's not something that you pray for or beg for. It is not an experience in which you can feel it, nor do you have an ecstatic related to it. It is automatic. It is commanded in Romans 6.13 and in Romans 12.1. The same word is used when it says yield uh, in 6.13 or present your body in 12.1. Uh, uh, Both are Greek, uh, the same Greek word, which means to place yourself at the disposal of. This is just a command. How to do it is not told there. It's just a command to do it. How to do it comes with 1 John 1, 9. See, grieve, grieving or quenching the Holy Spirit takes place when you sin. And if you deal with sin, according to 1 John 1, 9, you're automatically filled or controlled by God, the Holy Spirit, so that you can execute the plan of God. The second uh, uh, base of operations is the teaching ministry of uh, God the Holy Spirit in which he takes the Word of God which is communicated to you uh, and uh, makes it understandable in your soul for without this you could not understand without the, the control of the Holy Spirit you could not understand the teaching of the Word of God uh, John 14 26 John 16 12 to 14 uh, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 16 and 1 John 
2.17. Many believers go through all of their lives failing to understand the truth that uh, uh, the, the divine trinity lives within us. Uh, we've already noted something about the, uh, this uh, uh, next point, but we have to put it in because it is definitely a point. The church age is unique because of the availability of divine power to all believers. This previous point in this theory talks about the divine power, but the uh, point uh, here is of uh, it's available to all. See, even in the Old Testament, there were certain believers upon whom the Holy Spirit came uh, for the purpose of specific work. For example, when they were building the temple, God the Holy Spirit gave power to certain artisans who had unique abilities given to them at that particular time so that they were able to uh, build the temple. Because certain men of the Old Testament wrote the Old Testament Scripture. And when they did, they were moved and empowered by the same Holy Spirit. But less than 1% of all Old Testament believers knew anything about the divine power which was available. And it was only temporary. For see, David could pray in Psalm 51, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. We can't pray that because the Holy Spirit will never leave us, and therefore the power is always available to us. It's simply a matter of confession of sin. There's also available power in the Word of God. Uh, Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing center of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intent of the heart. The ninth of the unique uh, th provisions of the church age is that it is the age of no prophecy. There is no prophecy of the church age apart from for the two statements which are made by our Lord Jesus Christ in John 14 and in Acts 1 where he promises the coming of the church age. The things which take place from Pentecost all the way to the rapture all are signless, timeless events. And therefore it is not wise for a believer to look into previous dispensations, the Jewish age, or future dispensations, the end of the Jewish age, tribulation period, or the millennial kingdom period, to look into any of these for certain signs uh, that will tell us what's going to happen. The signs are all given uh, either of the tribulation or of the uh, millennial kingdom. Uh, there are no signs given of the church age. Uh, the only two uh, things which are given us, there, are, there is a prophecy related to the beginning, and that is the, uh, the day of Pentecost, and a, and a prophecy regarding the end, the rapture, uh, which is given by Paul. But it, neither one gives signs or times of anything. Uh, this is the only dispensation, therefore, which does not depend on prophecy, but rather depends upon what we call historical trends. Now by this we mean that the Lord Jesus Christ controls history. And the uptrends in human history are related to the church, the royal family, being obedient to Bible doctrine and evangelizing the world. The downtrends of human history are related to negative volition on the part of the royal family in which they become disobedient, they become spin-offs from the, uh, 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 their, their responsibility uh, of being the pivot and uh, functioning as the pivot. They spin off into reversionism and therefore the pivot begins to shrink uh, the pivot is that which preserves the, the, the salt of the land, that which preserves the nation. And so the Lord Jesus Christ moves history of nations in response to what believers are. And so we use the principle 
as the believer goes, so goes the nation. For the Lord blesses nations on the basis of what this group here called the royal family is doing. And if the royal family is disobedient, then uh, the church is, uh, uh, the, the world or the nation in which it is found is going downward. Uh, the, uh, the shrinking pivot then means judgment and discipline upon the nation. Now, the, the more believers who become a part of the spinoff, the, uh, the, less, the fewer opportunities come uh, into the believer's life to function. Now remember that both Bible doctrine and evil were in the world before the believer. Therefore, the believer cannot change either doctrine or evil. But evil can change the believer and doctrine can change the believer. The question is, to what will the believer respond or react in this time that he's here on the earth? Will he respond to Bible doctrine uh, or react to evil? Uh, and in which case he tries to whitewash the evil devil's world. He tries marches and tries to change the society uh, by means of uh, uh, pressures, political pressure, or whatever it may be, uh, realizing that this is uh, not his responsibility, that he is not to function in that particular way. But you will either be one or the other. Finally, the church age is distinct from every other age in that it is the age of the invisible hero. In every other dispensation, the heroes were visible, and they had a visible impact on the nation in which they lived. Elijah could go and say, there'll be no rain in this country until I say so, praying in accordance with the will of God. Jeremiah could announce that the king was wrong. Uh, Joshua, uh, David, all the others uh, were visible heroes. They had a visible impact. David's leadership was visible. Isaiah's leadership was visible. Jeremiah's leadership was visible. Ezekiel's uh, leadership was visible. Uh, Joel, Amos, their leadership was visible. Even after the 70-year captivity, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, all of their leadership was a visible leadership. Now our Lord Jesus Christ came along and he offered himself as the Messiah, the last of the visible heroes. He was the last of the visible heroes. But they rejected their visible hero. And therefore our Lord Jesus Christ became the first of the invisible heroes. He was going to have an not a visible impact, but an invisible impact on the world. And it was as such that he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Remember the principle that the day after the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, the world, where well, was nothing different about the world in which mankind lived. The sun rose at the same time it was supposed to. The sun set at the same time it was supposed to. The seasons continued. The, the world's climate continued. There was nothing different except for the fact that he had finished paying for all sin for all men for all time. He had the most fantastic impact that the world has ever seen, and yet it was invisible. You couldn't see it. You couldn't see atonement. You couldn't see salvation. You could not see uh, any of the doctrines related to reconciliation of man to God. It was invisible, and therefore... That began the, the principle of the invisible hero of the church age. All believers are designed to be invisible heroes. And the invisible hero is manufactured from two sources. We are manufactured through the teaching ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, inside while we function inside our own palace, the divine dinosphere. And secondly, the faithful communication... Uh, by a pastor teacher of Bible doctrine, uh, word by word, verse by verse, which is exegesis, plus categories, line upon line, one, two, three, four, uh, of Scripture. Especially the communication 
of the mystery doctrines of the church age. The, the believer uh, uh, advances to spiritual maturity by means of daily inhale of, of the Bible, and when he reaches spiritual maturity, he reaches the place of maximum invisible impact on his world And this implies, first of all, a blessing by association. There are people who receive fantastic blessing by being associated with this man. Uh, those who come into the, his periphery, whether it's his family, uh, friendships, uh, fellow members of a church or of a, of a club or a, a team or a society, in any way, there is fantastic blessing by association of the believer, uh, uh, with the believer who has reached spiritual maturity and, it ha and is having a maximum impact. Uh, uh, then, of course, there is the national impact, international impact, and angelic impact, all of which we have talked about. And there is one more which we didn't mention, that is heritage impact, in which once the believer leaves this life, he leaves behind him a heritage which is blessing uh, for those who were associated with him even in his death, so that uh, this explains why some uh, believers who are uh, out of fellowship prosper, because they were associated at one time with a tremendous uh, uh, invisible hero, and are still reaping the blessing of that association. And the thrilling thing is that the invisible hero can change the course of human history, because, of course, under principle of point nine, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ controls history on, on the basis of how it affects that invisible hero. And each day is a new opportunity for God to evaluate the invisible heroes and to therefore produce a historical circumstance or situation which is compatible with what he wants to do for these invisible heroes. And so we talk about uh, the church age with these ten characteristics as being a unique experiment. Now, an experiment uh, it has several meanings. First of all, uh, it is an operation undertaken to discover some unknown principle or effect. To discover something which is unknown, they, there is an experiment which goes on. That experiment takes place to discover something which previously has been, had been unknown. The hypostatic union was the experiment, the great power experiment of the hypostatic union. And it discovered something which had never, ever been done before. That man, a human being, can live under the power of the Holy Spirit. That was passed on to the great power experiment of the church age. And as a result of that, uh, it, is, it, it is discovering that it not only works for one person, the Lord Jesus Christ, but it works for every believer who will take advantage of it. And so experiment means to discover something which is unknown. But not only that, it also is to demonstrate a, some truth which is known. This occurs when the believer advances to spiritual maturity and he demonstrates in his spiritual advance that God can bless a believer and therefore bring glory to himself by means of that uh, the advance of this spiritual believer. It is also defined as a tangible result of a policy. The tangible result of the divine policy of grace is the believer's advance to spiritual maturity and uh, the tangible result is, is bl God blessing the pivot of this land. The adjective experimental is defined as the demonstration of power, and this is the uh, believer uh, utilizing Bible doctrine uh, inside of his soul uh, for the experiential uh, power to live the superhuman requirements that God re has for each one of us. And so uh, the, the believer 
uh, has some thrilling uh, things which belong to him and to him alone. And we as believers uh, need to understand it. And that's one of the reasons why in teaching about the church, we need to study the distinctions between the church and Israel so that we understand why we are not the New Testament church as opposed to Israel being the Old Testament church. We do not go back to the Old Testament for our precedent. You see, everything has a precedence. We don't go back to the Old Testament for our precedence, which is why we do not go back to the Old Testament uh, as far as uh, morality being uh, the way of life. The Christian is very moral, but he's much more than moral. Morality is taught in the Old Testament Mosaic Law, but spirituality is much more than morality, and it is something just for this age. That is also the reason that we do not go back to tithing. Tithing was the Old Testament income tax for believers. It is not for this age. The, pro the principle for this age is given in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay by as uh, God has prospered him. You give as God has prospered, not on the basis of a percentage of your income. And obviously, the more God prospers, the more one is able to give. Tithing was an income tax for believers and unbelievers alike. And as a matter of fact, 10% uh, was, uh, uh, was the tax for running the government. There was also a 10% tax, which was for the priests and the Levites. And there was a 10% tax for the poor. So there was a 30% tax. Okay, instead of one tithe, it was three tithes that was given. And I never hear anybody talking about that when they go back to the legalism. Uh, of the uh, of the time. Furthermore, uh, Sabbath observance was something that was related to the Old Testament. And there is no Sabbath anymore. The Sabbath beginning on Friday evening and running till Saturday evening sundown uh, has been abrogated. And we now are free from all kinds of Sabbath observance, whether it be Saturday observance or people who call the Sunday the Sabbath and who are afraid to... Uh, 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 play baseball on Sunday afternoon, or even some Christians won't even watch a baseball game because they're so spiritual, they don't want to break the Sabbath. That's ridiculous. That's Old Testament. Furthermore, this principle of corporate worship. Now, we gather together for a study, not for corporate worship. The believer worships individually. John chapter 4, verse 24 tells us very clearly where that takes place. But we don't gather for worship. We gather for study. We don't have a sanctuary for worship, such as people will refer to the church as the sanctuary. We have an auditorium. Uh, all of these things are distortions of the Old Testament law in one way or another. But we don't go back to the Old Testament law. The Lord Jesus Christ, in his the first part of his ministry, went back to the precedent of the Old Testament law. But once he was rejected as the Messiah... He began functioning entirely under the great power experiment of the hypostatic union. And the precedent for the church is not to go back to all of these things related to there, but to go back to how our Lord lived his life uh, under the principle of the great power experiment. How, how did he live this life? Did his deity spill over and help his humanity? Absolutely not. What happened is he trusted in the omnipotence of the Holy Spirit plus the omnipotence of the Word of God and he lived this life. The church looks back and saw, said he did it. He turned it over to us. Okay, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, Acts 1-8. And now the church functions under the precedent of what happened in the hypostatic union of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so uh, it's thrilling to, to realize that we are unique and that we use the Old Testament for illustration, we use the Old Testament for application, but the teaching of the New Testament truth is found in the fantastic uh, mystery doctrines related to the church age. Now, we're, this is still Roman numeral number two under the doctrine of the church. Roman numeral two is distinctions between the church and Israel. And the first thing we looked at was the principle of dispensationalism, the second thing we looked at was the principle of the uniqueness of the church age. The third thing we, know, we see now are some similarities 
between Israel and the church. Now, there are seven similarities between Israel and the church. One is that both have an acceptable standing on the part of man before God. They're not the same, but we have an acceptable standing before God. Secondly, we have required of us, just as they, a manner of life which is consistent with the standing. Thirdly, there is a divinely appointed service. It is a different kind of service in the Old and New Testaments, but it is a divinely appointed service. Fourthly, there is a righteous ground on which the uh, God may graciously forgive and cleanse the erring. The Old Testament looked forward to the work of Christ. We look backward upon it. Five, there is also a clear revelation on the, of the human side of divine forgiveness, uh, 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 pardon me, on the human side of uh, the responsibility of de receiving divine forgiveness. How does a person receive divine forgiveness from the human standpoint? Okay, in uh, the Old Testament was the sacrifice of animals. In the New Testament, it is on the basis of confession of sin. Sixthly, it is an, an effective basis for pr our prayer life. And seventhly, both of us have a future hope, though it is a different kind of a hope. And we say that just as the United States and Great Britain uh, have many similar laws. We are not the same nation. We are do two distinct nations. So that it, so it is with Israel and the church. Just because Israel and the church have some similarities does not mean that they are the same. Now I'm not going to go into the details on the next uh, point uh, or two, uh, because uh, I but it will be concluded in the book. The next section would be some specific contrasts, uh, 25 to be, exam to be specific, 25 contrasts between Israel and the church, which I will take directly from Lewis Berry Chafer and uh, put uh, into uh, the book. Uh, so uh, I can uh, uh, then just a couple of uh, little things that are left under this second major point in the doctrine of the church. Uh, I was talking uh, previously uh, about uh, the word intercalation. That the church is an intercalation. That word may not be as too familiar to us, uh, such as the word interpolation. Now, an interpolation is to insert a word or a phrase into a context. A parenthesis is uh, sustained some relationship uh, to that which goes before and that which goes after it. And that's why we used to talk about the, uh, that the church age was a parenthesis, but uh, it's really an interpolation or an uh, intercalation which introduces, an intercalation introduces, it may introduce a uh, day uh, into the uh, to the calendar it may introduce a uh, period of time into the calendar but it is the introduction of something which is new and different something which is not necessarily related to what is before and afterwards something that is different that's why it is called an intercalation it is also called as we said have said a mystery uh, and so we have uh, finished the first two major points in the doctrine of the church. Now, I would like to move into uh, uh, then uh, briefly uh, point number four, which is the purpose of the church. Why are we here? I think that many of us fail to realize what the reason was that God brought into existence this unique organism, the church. We have already uh, 
noted the principle found in Matthew chapter 28. But we will turn to it once again, just briefly, to note again what God tells us is the, minute, is the purpose of the church. Matthew chapter 28, and we actually look at verses 18 and following, particularly verses 19 and 20. When he says in verse 18, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. This is the basis. It is the authority which is given to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is, remember, the head of the church. And as the head, he gives us direction. And the direction comes in verse 19, which does not say, therefore, go. It actually begins with the word therefore, but the, the word therefore is on the basis of his authority. The next word is actually the aorist passive participle from the uh, uh, Greek verb poruomai, which looks like this. P-O-R-E-U-O M A I. Now, the aorist participle precedes the action of the main verb always. The, the whatever action is described in the in the aorist participle always takes place before the action of the main verb. Now, the action of the of the main verb uh, comes out in that actually appears there are two main verbs they appear twice, but in in the uh, the main verb is the aorist imperative of uh, the word mathete, which means to disciple. So, before you can disciple, you must poruomai. Before you can uh, do this, you have to do this. Now, therefore, we understand that this is going to be an action which precedes. Now, what does poruomai mean? Peri it does mean to go and come, actually. To be going... Uh, and coming. But the participle is uh, a verbal adjective, and so it must be translated such as that. The passive voice, the subject, receives the action of the verb, and the aorist tense refers to simply a point of time. It doesn't refer necessarily to something which uh, is now finished or going, I mean, but the part of aorist participle tells us that since it takes place before this, it's something which is uh, taking place prior to being able to fulfill this responsibility. And so we will translate it with the passive voice, having gone. Having gone where? Beloved, our field is the world. Go ye, says Mark, go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. Acts 1, 8, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and in all Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the world. The responsibility of the church is having gone in response to the commands of God to disciple. Now, disciple simply looks like this in the Greek. M-A-T-H-E-T-E-S, mathetes, and it, it means several things. Okay. It has to do with uh, making a student who is going to become an adherent uh, who uh, listens to the instructions uh, given or obeys the instructions which are given to him. Some, you see that he becomes an adherent very often to the teacher or to the teaching of a teacher. The disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ became adherents to the teacher and obedient to the instructions of the teacher, we would, we would assume. Then it tells how you make disciples in the two present participles. This is an aorist imperative. 
the aorist tense and the imperative mood. The imperative mood is a command. So the aorist tense now refers to a just a simple point of time, any point of time. Having gone in any point of time, you make a disciple. How do you make a disciple? Well, two words are used, baptize and teach. Baptize has to do with evangelizing, but more than just giving the gospel, it, re it also brings in the positive response to the gospel in which they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. After having done that, then the disciples were to teach. Uh, and that uh, word is used to teach a group uh, uh, together. So you have uh, the, the great responsibility of the church. Evangelism and teaching. And again, where do we do it? Well, we do it in the whole world. The world begins uh, where we are. And that's important. That's, we, we should be evangelizing where we are. We should be uh, teaching where we are. But it should not be limited to that. It should reach beyond ourselves. And the principle is given in Acts 1.8. Uh, in Jerusalem, uh, which is the city in which they were located. Then uh, in Judea, which was the province in which Jerusalem was located. We would say our state. Then in Samaria. Samaria was, was two things. First of all, it was a an adjoining state or province, but it was also a place which was hated, neglected, despised by the average Jew. Okay, so there are, I think, a couple of connotations in this. Number one, it's reaching out beyond where you are to adjoining areas, but not limiting it to the nicer areas, but to the sometimes repulsive parts uh, of the area in which you you live, the uh, uh, nece not necessarily where uh, the people are all going to sit there with open arms. And then he goes on to say, under the uttermost parts of the world, and the uttermost parts of the world means exactly that to all the world, to the very ends of the earth, except that the earth is round that doesn't have any ends. And so, as a result, the responsibility of the church. And this is the local church. This is not talking about a, a denomination, because there are no denominations in Scripture. The local church has the responsibility of reaching out. And the, what, what should be done is, uh, here is a local church, which is evangelizing its area and teaching Bible doctrine. That local church should be always aware of the opportunities and the challenges which are out there. And this may, may be in several areas. Can it, it, the best way is to, to uh, find someone uh, who is uh, qualified by God and prepared by God to go to a particular area who are engaged in uh, the, either one of the two things or both. And that is uh, the baptizing or the evangelization and the teaching. And the formation in these areas of... Uh, totally, completely independent local churches there. And this local church, by, and by doing the same thing that this one was doing, will then also begin to, to reach out beyond itself. And it will form a local church, uh, which will be baptizing and teaching. And uh, if, if they're doing it and they're doing it, you see how the principle works. Uh, uh, B and T, uh, not bacon and tomato, but uh, baptize and teach. Uh, baptize and teach. Uh, all local churches. N no relationship to this church except that it was started by this church or supported by this church or encouraged by this church. But you see how it works. And if each of these is doing what it's supposed to be doing, uh, maybe even not everything results in a local church. But if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, uh, you're going to be consistently having more and more and it's going to, uh, to be uh, consistently growing. Uh, it's going to be reaching out. Uh, it's going to be touching uh, through an invisible heroship. Not through uh, the changing of the society, 
but by moving out. And we determine, uh, maybe this church will determine that someone in its midst has a particular spiritual gift. Uh, and uh, uh, they will say, we will assume support uh, or partial support of this person so that this person with the spiritual gift can go over here and uh, begin the work of uh, baptizing and teaching uh, and the formation of this local church can hopefully, eventually, the, the support will be cut off and this church will be taking on support of this church uh, uh, from, the, from the sending of someone with a spiritual gift over here. That, that thing multiplies around the world. And that's uh, the beginning of the purpose of the church, uh, to be uh, evangelizing and to be teaching and training. Evangelizing, teaching, and training. And how one does it, the amazing, the amazing thing about Scripture is that it's very, very limited as far as telling you how to do it. It tells us to do it, but the Holy Spirit is the author of ingenuity. And how He's going to do it, we don't know. How He does it, uh, He doesn't limit Himself to what worked in one period or generation. And what worked at one time may not work in another. What works in one place may not work in another place. And so there's nothing wrong with trying something, saying, well, it just doesn't work. We'll have to move on and try something else. No, we have to say that the purpose of the local church has never changed from that time on. And we see it throughout the book of Acts. We see it throughout even the epistles. We note the, the tremendous opportunities and God says today, the Lord Jesus Christ says today, the same as he did to the church at Philadelphia in the book of Revelation, I set before you an open door, and no man will shut it. But no man can shut the doors. Doors are open and closed on the basis of the Lord Jesus Christ discerning positive volition. Perhaps today, somewhere in this world, there is, quote, a man of Macedonia who is saying to God, Lord, send us someone. And God is somewhere preparing someone to be the someone to go, like the Apostle Paul. Immediately, we, he heard the voice, but immediately we went to Macedonia. And the church at Macedonia was formed. No relationship to the other churches, except that, they received, that Paul received support from the previous church. So you see, God is doing His work. And as long as we are here, as, until the rapture of the church takes place and we're gone, we're never absolved of this tremendous responsibility which is ours. And we need to be sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the author of ingenuity, as to how the best way to do, to fulfill our responsibility, to baptize and to teach. Baptize and to teach. Let us pray. Now thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gracious privilege which is ours of being a part of this organism called the local church. Uniquely designed, uniquely empowered to go into the world which is hostile toward it. A world which generally says, we don't want you. Because somewhere in the world there are those who are positive at the point of God consciousness who are saying, come over and help us. And so it is that the church responds as individual believers provide the wherewithal so that each local church can reach out to accomplish the purpose that you have intended for it here on the earth. We're not here to play spiritual ring around the rosy with ourselves. We're not here to become ingrown. We're not here to develop... Uh, playground for for believers but uh, we're here to baptize and to teach and help us never to forget the command that you have given to us you shall be witnesses unto me unto the uttermost parts of the world in jesus name i pray amen you're dismissed